There we go. Mic check. There it is. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. Bonus, <laughs> turn your mic on. Ba -bum -ba -bum. <laughs> Weird Sanchez 69. Nice to see you guys. Sorry about all of that, guys. All right. Let's start this all over again, shall we? Here we go. Welcome to the Wake Up America show. I'm your host, Austin Peterson. We're glad and thankful to have you here. Thank God that I monitor the Rumble chat. You know what I'm saying? You guys saved me there. All right, so every once in a while, you know, just decides to turn off all of the microphones. Boomer figured out his technology. Shut up, okay? <laughs> We've raised $8 towards the bonus content this morning, and I appreciate you guys for uh, letting me know that something's wrong. I bet you if I went and text, checked my text messages over there, at 573-319-1586, that we've got a lot of text messages. Yep, mic is silent. The audio, bro, you're mute. Good morning, your mic is not in. Uh, and then Jay says, loved Javier Malay of Argentina, has been big true. 
no idea what's going on here. Uh, the listener of lies. Anti-school choice people. Here we go. Okay. Blue Truck says, this almost makes it more entertaining, knowing this isn't a Hollywood-produced high-production value thing. It's just another human out there on the internet doing his best. Yes, that's very true. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. All right. Man, you guys are just throwing us cash. I appreciate that. Bonus content's going to be unlocked in no time. Today is the very last in the series of the bonus content, the guns that won, the guns that helped to build the American Republic. What will it be? You guys guessed successfully all the other times, the M1 Garand, the M16, the 1911. You're never going to guess it. No, you're never going to guess it. No, you're never going to guess it. No, you're never going to guess it. My gun is. Uh, no, you're never going to guess it. Uh, welcome to the Wake Up America show. Hope you guys are enjoying the new artificial intelligence created music this morning. Oh my God, how many texts is I guess Stephanie's telling me my mic is off in my DMs, sliding in my DMs this morning. Um, so anyways, uh, Guokas reminds us that boomers invented all that. You know what? You're welcome. Anyways, so what was I saying a little bit earlier? Okay, uh, we were talking about taxation is theft. Yes, yeah, Stephanie and I saw our taxes yesterday from the accountant. Man, the government has just bled us dry. It's that self-employment tax, you know? That's what we get for trying to be an entrepreneur. The government doesn't want you to be an entrepreneur. They don't want you to work for yourself. They don't want the Wake Up America show to succeed. They don't want us to create new jobs. They don't want, they want all of us on the dole. They want us working down at the plant, working nine to five, going into the office so that the real estate prices go back up. They want you, they, they're like, oh, here, we'll give you health care as part of your benefits working for the for the man. Why don't you just come down here? You don't need to start your business. Oh, you want to start a business? Well, we're going to put a self-employment tax on you. And our effective tax rate, Stephanie and I saw yesterday, was 40%. No, God! No, God, 40%. Please, no, no, no! Urs Mommy saying foul words again, AP for Liberty, not necessarily please. Yes, there's going to be some foul words actually in this rant because here's what I'm going to say. Turn it down a little bit for the little, the little children because I have a little rant to say that I'm actually going to lip sync here because here's what the government wants. They want to bankrupt me and Stephanie. They want to take every last dime that we have and they want to stop us from creating a media company that spreads these ideas, right? That's why they put, they, they taxed us at, a, at an effective rate of 40% and drained us bone dry yesterday. That's why they did that to us, because they don't want us being entrepreneurs. They don't want us to be self-efficient. That's why they put that self-employment tax in there, is to stop people like Stephanie and I from being able to have the freedom to enjoy our lives. They just want us to go and work for the man, go to put push out some boxes at the plant, right? Take your one vacation a year if you're lucky, right? And at the end of your life, maybe you'll retire and get social security, maybe not. They hate you, they want us to stop, they want us to quit. Don't go work for yourself, don't be successful, but I've got a message for the feds who just stole every penny me and my wife had, and here it is, and it's gonna be profanity laden. Are you ready? I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. There you go. There you go. I'm not leaving. I'm not effing leaving. All right, so there's all the profanity that you're going to get this morning for the most part. Uh, until you start cursing when Larry Sharp joins us at 7.30 this morning. <laughs> Are you telling me there was no sound there during that as well either? You're telling me that you did not get the audio of that? Please tell me that's not true. Please tell me that I did just do this. What is going on this morning? Here we go. All right. The Wall Street, the Wall Street clip. Okay, let's see if, it, if this time it works. I'm not leaving. 
There it is. I'm not leaving. I'm not fucking leaving! The show goes on! The show goes on. This is my home! They're gonna need a fucking wrecking ball to take me out of here! They're gonna need to send in the National Guard a fucking SWAT team, cause I ain't going nowhere! Uh, I ain't leaving. Uh, Stephanie and I aren't leaving. We're keeping the Wake Up America show right here. Technical problems, all kinds of weirdness. <laughs> all right, yeah. On the inside, I'm panicking. <laughs> Things are falling apart. Hope to God everything works when Larry Sharp joins us at 7.30 a.m. Central Time. We're going to hear from him. He is now an official consultant for Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s PAC. And a great voice cried out. That, do, happily or... Just see what you see, how you feel about it. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. could possibly run for president of the United States under the Libertarian Party line. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. You can send us a text at 573-319-1586. We'll hear from Larry Sharp about that at 7.30 a.m. Central. At 8 a.m. Central time, we're going to hear from Camelia Peterson to talk about why Americans say they don't want a dictatorship, but they're creating one anyway. Too many people think democracy works only if they get to dominate their opponents. We're going to talk to CJ about that. I'll get also get her take on what she thinks about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. running on the LP line. At 8.30 a.m. Central Time, I'm looking forward to hearing from Daniela Pensack. She's back. Yes. <laughs> Two awesome stories from Daniela to cover this morning. Uh, one is that strippers in Alabama sue over a socialist economic system. Yeah, they have to share their tips. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up America with Austin Peterson's on. Uh, the Joker 2 fandom, the new movie, the Joker movie. Or, uh, did you see the first one? It was pretty good. The second one, I love this article from Jezebel, the old, uh, the old uh, rag that came out last year. She wants to talk about this, about the Joker 2 fandom that will marry men's rights activists and the Internet's loudest girls. <laughs> Wake up America with Austin Peterson's on. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Daniela. We're going to hear from Camelia. We're going to hear from Larry Sharp. It's going to be an awesome show now that the internet, now that the actual audio is working. Yes. Good morning. Wake up America with Austin Peterson's on. Um, bah, 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 bah. Uh, inflation is back. Uh, yeah, sorry about that one. I know. Um, <laughs> Good news is, is it might elect Donald, re-elect Donald Trump. So, yeah, at the start of the year, it looked like inflation was finally coming to an end. But consumer prices rose 0.4% in March. The annual inflation rate ticked up about 3.5%, according to data from the Department of Labor. Labor. So-called core inflation, that filters out the categories like, oh, I don't know, food and energy prices, that also jumped 0.4% in the past month, and it's climbed by about 3.8% since a year ago. Both of those figures were higher than expected. 
we were thinking that we might even see a cut in interest rates this year. I know a lot of people who are looking to buy homes were hoping for that. Well, guess what? Screw you. We're from the government and we're here to help. Uh, oh, and also it's April 15th on Monday. So pay your taxes, surf, and go to hell or else. If you're enjoying the content this morning, don't forget to click that like button and follow us on rumble.com. We also have a brand new community over on Locals, wakeupamericashow.locals.com. It's time for us to put America From first. From now on, it's going to be America first, okay? America first. America first uh, at wakeupamericashow.locals.com. I'm highly encouraging you guys to go and sign up. Get a free month's subscription if you use the coupon Liberty Local. I know you guys, some of you were asking for a community where you could go and interact and make friends and hang out with each other when the show isn't live. And we're going to be gone tomorrow, although there will be a stream. We're going to do a replay tomorrow morning. So when you see tomorrow morning's show, it won't be live. It'll be a replay of last Friday's Freedom Family Friday when Hannah Cox was on, my brother was on, and we were talking about kind of war of the sexes kind of stuff. It was a great episode. So if you'd like to still hang out with the Cantina crew tomorrow morning, we will be live. Uh, well, the show will be playing, but I will not be here. Uh, Stephanie and I are going to go to Monticello to, so she can see Thomas Jefferson's home, which is, has been one of her lifelong dreams. So we're taking her there. It's kind of our last hurrah, big trip, before uh, Stephanie has her baby because you're really not supposed to be flying in that last trimester. So as we enter the end of the second trimester, and soon we'll be entering the third trimester of her pregnancy. <laughs> Little baby Hazel, we're gonna go to Monticello and she will be infused with the spirit of Thomas Jefferson. And uh, so uh, it's gonna be a great, uh, a great trip. And then we're gonna go to the Cherry Blossom Festival on Saturday, so it would be beautiful. One listener just texted into the show this morning, said, did I miss the St. Louis Doom Loop yesterday? Uh, you did, so did everyone, and I apologize for that. Uh, I did advertise that story, but I didn't have time to get to it. So uh, if you'd like, I can send you the um, the story that I was basing it off of. If you'd like to read a little bit more about that, I'll send you the Wall Street Journal article actually right now. If you ever need our sources or things like that, I'm going to start trying to get better at including those in the show notes. Uh, but for now, I'll just go ahead and text it to you. So if you have questions like that, again, you can send us a text at 573 573- 319-1586. Rob from Missouri. First time texting us. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for listening in. So, uh, yeah, sorry I missed that story yesterday. I just didn't have time. I was complaining about NPR. Um, so, anyway, so inflation, right? Prices going up. This is bad for the country, probably good for Donald Trump's re-election prospects, but Nobody's better for Donald Trump's re-election prospects than the, you know, commander in thief, Joe Biden, who is an absolute and complete and utter moron and liar. Take a listen. From the very beginning, I used to teach the Second Amendment in law school. From the very beginning, there were limitations. You couldn't own a cannon. You couldn't uh, you could own a, a rifle, a gun, but you, there were weapons certain things you couldn't. But they weren't weapons of war. You're a stupid idiot and a moron. And yes, absolutely, Americans could and did own cannons. And as a matter of fact, during the American Revolutionary War, since the Navy was basically non-existent, the people who were fighting the naval war against the British were, guess what, American privateers with merchant ships that had been outfitted with, yeah, you guessed it, cannons. And rifles that were used by American citizens were the same rifles that were used in the military, and those were weapons of war. There were no limits on the Second Amendment during uh, the American Revolution. When they wrote the Second Amendment in 1786, I guess that was after the war, there were no limitations on cannons. You could absolutely own cannons. And God dang it, if that doesn't, this doesn't make me want to own a cannon, just because you want to take it How away. How dare you! Exactly. Privateers did own cannons. Uh, looks like we've raised uh, $40 or so towards our $50 goal of our wake up. Speaking of <laughs> cannons, uh, if you'd like to unlock it before Larry Sharp comes on this morning, you're definitely going to want to see the bonus content. So if we raise at least 10 more dollars, then I'll be able to play that instead of a commercial break. So um, guys, get your rumble rants in now so I can play the play the uh, bonus content instead of a commercial. Uh, if you'd like to see that this morning, if not, then I'll play our regular commercials 
Um, you know, it's, I, this video just made me laugh yesterday. Look at this, the Biden, they call this the Biden shuffle. Look at this, look how Joe Biden walks. <laughs> Are you not entertained? Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, that's our commander in chief there. Um, give him a break. He has a diaper full, says Liberty Shindig. <laughs> appreciate you guys over at rumble.com this morning. We appreciate all of our listeners and viewers joining us live. Again, you can text the show at 573 319 1586. That's 573-319-1586. Didn't have time to cover it. <clears throat> okay, so where are we at right now? The shuffle is from his diaper bunching. Uh, people are asking. <laughs> uh, you guys are full of some funny jokes. I need, we need to get you guys as guests <laughs> on the show. Real Hunter Human is asking if the show is down or is it mine? Yeah, sometimes Rumble has a little bit of issues. Just refresh your browser. You should be able to find us again. We're also over on x.com, 169 people, almost the exact same amount of people watching on X as there is on Rumble. Uh, so do us a favor if you're over on x.com, click hearts onto the uh, stream and repost us in your uh, timeline so other people can find out about our ideas. We appreciate you very much. Um, the Wake Up America show is going to be covering not only the uh, RFK Jr. story today, we're also going to be covering the uh, the... Uh, FISA bill, which was not exactly killed. I'm a little, I'm a little, you know, confused by the legislature, what I'm hearing today about what happened with FISA yesterday. Uh, Thomas Massey says, many people have been misled today. There was a vote on the resolution. There was not a vote on the FISA bill. I thought that they had voted it down for at least from the headlines I was reading. There was a vote on a resolution that would have allowed FISA as well as six amendments to it, including a warrant requirement amendment and three other pieces of legislation to come to the floor. Um, but the headline I'm reading over here at Fox News says, House Republicans blast cry wolf conservatives who tanked FISA renewal bill. Choo-choo-choo. Boy, there's just so much breaking news going on this morning, guys. Looks like we uh, crossed the line there with Quest Fanning. Um, uh, hit our $50. Oh, wait, we got $8 left. There we go, $8. Thank you, Quest. So um, we are going to have to go to a commercial break, though, because i got to go get Larry Sharp. So get those donations in. You'll be able to see... The bonus content by the time Larry Sharp's interview is over. We'll be right back on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Expansive time. A year might seem like a mere moment, but oh, what a year it's been. In September 2022, Austin and Stephanie Peterson embarked on a journey, a journey to wake up America. They began humbly with just 20 souls tuning in, learning, listening. And though challenges arose, like the looming shadow of YouTube demonetization, their spirit never waned. And now, thanks to you, thousands rise with the sun to join them, to listen, to engage, to be a part of a community. So here's to you and to wake up America. For memories shared, for friends made, for the journey ahead, and for never, ever forgetting to rise and freedom. Happy anniversary. I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message. Believe me, Austin Peterson is the best. He's got the greatest Wake Up America show I've ever seen. Whenever I tune in in the mornings and watch the live stream, let me tell you, he has got the absolute best content. I love his guests. It's just a total blast to watch. And I highly endorse and recommend the Wake Up America show. It's terrific. Believe me. Is the outdoor your home about as exciting as a library? Then spice it up and unbore your space with our custom metal signs. Crafted with love and a bit of libertarian magic, you can customize your own metal sign at ap4libertyshop.com. So head to ap4libertyshop.com, customize your own metal sign today.
Welcome to a world of vocal discovery at Peterson Voice Studio. I'm Justin Peterson, here to guide your musical journey. Envision a place where your voice reaches new heights, where every note tells a story. We embrace all singers, from the enthusiastic shower vocalists to aspiring stars, ensuring each voice finds its unique rhythm and tone. Are you ready to elevate your voice? Visit petersonvoicestudio.com and sign up for remote lessons tailored just for you. Let's begin this melodious journey together. Tired of spending your hard-earned money on woke corporations that don't share your pro-freedom values? Fed up with sipping liberal lattes and progressive cappuccinos? Introducing Founding Flavors from AP for Liberty Shop. Get your day started with Washington's revolutionary roast. As robust and principled as the man himself, this blend is the shot of energy heard round the world. Or maybe you want to taste the fervor of freedom with Adams's patriotic perk. It's as dynamic and balanced as the U.S. Constitution, sure to awaken your spirit of liberty. For the aficionados, we've got the Jeffersonian Java, a complex mix of flavors that speaks volumes about your refined tastes. And don't forget Betsy's Liberty Lullaby, our decaf option. Crafted with the same care and dedication Betsy Ross put into our star-spangled banner, this blend lets you enjoy the taste of freedom anytime without losing sleep. No woke beans here, folks. Just pure, patriotic patriotic pro-freedom flavors brewed with love for liberty. So why compromise your principles for a cup of coffee? Stand up for your values, perk up your patriotism, and start your day the American way. Get your founding flavors at apforlibertyshop.com. Welcome back to the Wake Up America show. Good morning, rise in freedom. I'm Austin Peterson. Me and my buddy Larry Sharp, we were just bitching about taxes, which we could do for hours, but I'm not bringing Larry Sharp on to talk about taxes. We're bringing Larry Sharp to talk about, I don't know, maybe just a little scoop. I saw this news headline yesterday, or at least I consider it to be news, that RFK Jr. might have made a donation to the Libertarian Party. And then I saw a tweet that said that Larry Sharp was consulting for Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s PAC, and I know Larry Sharp, so I reached out to Larry Sharp, and now Larry Sharp is on the show. Maybe he'll. Good morning, my brother. How you doing? I I gotta tell you, I think the people who keep saying that are really just trying to move the media cycle. And I think it's not a bad thing for them. I think it's a great idea. I, I People think I'm crazy when I say it, but I cannot tell you how happy I am that RFK Jr. is running. I think it is one of the best things in the long run for the Libertarian Party. This year, we're going to have a problem because it's going to take a lot of votes that would have come to us, I think, this year. Um, but in the long run, it is nothing but good. People are talking about ballot access like there's no tomorrow. People are talking about contingent election like there's no tomorrow. And I've been trying to get back when you and I, in 2016, were trying to get on the ticket ourselves. Back in those days, I was hooping and hollering about Gary Johnson, trying to get him to, to do, you know, focus on one place, move out from there. I thought New Mexico back then, because he was the governor. That's what I thought back then. But no. So th several pieces. I'm sorry. I went, I went out because I'm excited about this whole idea. But let me cover a couple of things. One, is he going to run Libertarian? I don't think so. I don't think so. Literally, as I consult for the PAC, we've, we've gone out of our way to try to get him on the ballot, not as libertarian, but as, on his own, right? To get on the ballot. And we, the PAC has worked on four states. And obviously the campaign will work on even more. So I don't think that's happening. Does he want libertarian votes? Of course he does. Wouldn't you, right? When, when, when you ran Republican, you were still looking for libertarian votes. So I think it's savvy for the campaign to search for libertarian votes. They should. If I was, I'm not working for the campaign. If I was, I'd be telling them, try to get libertarian votes. Of course you would. 
Why wouldn't you do that? Well, so it, I do not think he's running it, libertarian. But wouldn't it be in his best interest? Votes. But Larry, wouldn't it be in his best interest to run as a libertarian so he gets that sweet, sweet ballot access and the LP gets the attention, the media, and the cash? I mean, it seems like, yep. politically speaking, it's a match made in heaven. Libertarianly speaking, it's a match made in hell. But who? nobody cares about what libertarians <laughs> think. That party is there to make money for the political candidate and to give them fame and attention as they ride off into the political sunset, right? I wish you were wrong and not mad that you said it because you're not supposed to say the thing, right? How dare you say the thing? But you did say the thing. Uh, the reality of it is, I actually think that the best spot for him probably would have been forward party, to tell you the truth. Um, forward party needed ballot access more than we do. Forward party would have been able to get ballot access with him. But your point's a valid one. There are a lot of people in the LP who say exactly what you, you see. If Bobby Kennedy Jr. had run as a libertarian, we would have gotten 50 state ballot access for sure. He would have gotten on, on the uh, a ticket and he would have gotten 50 state ballot access for sure. We probably would get 5%. We'd get the matching funds for 2028. All good things. I think these are all positive things. The problem is if you do that, how do you how do you change the Libertarian Party, right? Do you make the Libertarian Party just the vehicle, which is what Forward Party is supposed to be, right? Andrew Inga said openly, Forward Party is a vehicle. Well, if you're just a vehicle, well, there we go. Libertarian Party is supposed to not just be a vehicle. That's what it's not. It's what it's supposed to be. So I see that point. But the other piece is to be very forward with you. Bobby Kennedy Jr. is his own person and wants his own way, and he wants his own vice president. You know as well as I do. That's not how the Libertarian Party works. But it is if how he it decides works, to but do it that is how it works, because if he ha if he could get enough votes to get himself across the finish line, yeah. just like we saw in 2016 when you and I were running, the, the presidential candidate can force through their president, their vice presidential pick. It, it might be a difficult battle, but they gave us Bill Weld. They didn't give us Larry Sharp. Yes, but if you remember, Larry Sharp fought his ass off to make sure that Bill Weld was not going to be our nominee. And I lost by only 31 votes. Not that I'm counting. Austin, you're counting. Stop counting. I'm not counting. So by, by only, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Stop saying I'm bitter. So just because I lost by 31 votes. Um, and I was some Joe Schmo, right? I, I, was, I was new to the scene when that happened. And they thought I might actually win that damn thing. So I don't think it's an easy task for him to just come in and take his VP. And it, to it might not be easy, line. but it is possible. Okay, let me be clear. Yes. Look, is it possible that all of a sudden the campaign decides, hey, let's go get the libertarian line and let's go try to get our VP? But just think of what the campaign must be thinking. If if they go down that route, what happens if they lose their VP? It's not a done deal. They would have to go there really believing that they were going to be able to get their VP or somehow sacrifice their VP, either one. Is that something the campaign wants to do? I would argue probably not. So I think, I, from what I see, the Bobby Kennedy Jr. campaign is going out of its way to get on the ballot in all 50 states and DC without the libertarian line. That's what I see now. If they change their, their mind, they might, they still have a month or so to change their mind. But you know how hard that is. This is not an easy task. People outside of the party think you can just decide to do it. Yes, if you're, if you're a puppet party, like in many states, many states are puppet parties, right? In my state, New York, the, the conservative party is a puppet party. They do whatever the Republican party says. There's no real policy. The working families party is a, is a puppet party for Democrats in my state. So whatever they say, they'll just do. If you, but you don't realize something. The Greens and the Libertarians both, we are ideologues. We don't just do what they do. Greens don't do what the Democrats say. They don't. They still do their own thing no matter what. They have their own people. They tell them to go to hell. They do whatever they want, right? They have Jill Stein running. So they're, they're going to go against it. I don't see this as being a simple thing at all. It's not simple, but it is possible. And if you have enough money, anything can get done. Remember, the whole, the whole point of Bill Weld was because of the money. The LP needed the money. And listen, if the LP needed the money any time in its history, it needs it more. more it, the, R, yes. the, Libertarian Party need, the, the Libertarian Party needs RFK Jr. more than RFK Jr. needs the LP. Am I right? I think that's an accurate statement. I would agree. Um, I think you're right. But even if you, even if, even if you said, yes, wait a minute, Larry, let's just get the money. Let's just do it. Sure. Are you going to get a thousand libertarian delegates? Remember, even when Gary Johnson ran in 2016, he ran the whole gamut. You had more than one debate with him. Remember? <clears throat> you had more than one debate with him, right? 
he went to the gamut. He was going to all the conventions, doing all the things. This is not what the the, the Bobby Kennedy campaign has done. But it doesn't it, matter again. But it doesn't, but it doesn't matter, Larry, because at the end of the day, run, going to all of those those conventions didn't mean jack squat. It was it was actually now that I look back, it was a waste of time and money to go to all of the states to crisscross the country. the 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 smart money would have been to buy hotel rooms, to buy vaca to buy mini vacations for delegates, to show up to the convention take it over and then to take the nomination. If if Robert I think F. you're Kennedy, right, that, that can work. If Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wants the LP nomination, it's his for the taking. If he buys enough hotel rooms, flights, and uh and you know and stays, weekend stays for people to go to the LP convention. It's just money, Larry. It's not about it's not about principle. It's not about showing up to the conventions. It's about it's about hard earned cash going into flights and hotel rooms and telling the delegates, here's your free weekend vacation. You just have to show up at this time to vote. And you can also get your uh, your VP pick through that way, Larry. It's not just cynical, it's also true. Okay, it's true if you were to. And to be full with you, last year, that was possible. Now all the delegates basically, I mean, there's a couple who are, but almost all the delegates are already picked. So you've already, the delegates are already picked. They already have the people they want. Are you telling me that you honestly think that anybody, Bobby Kennedy or anybody with money, right, could just go, you know what? Let me bribe 520 people who have already been picked. Let me call them all up, bribe them, and hope they will all show up, even though at least half of them, at least if not more, already have their you know, hotels set, select up, already have their subset. Point of order, point it's, of order. It's a month point and a half away. Point of order, point of order. Uh, the floor will recognize the, the host, the chair to speak. Uh, and what I will say is that all it requires is a simple rule change at the convention to allow new delegates to be credentialed. And by the way, that's in the Libertarian Party's best interest to credential delegates on the floor at the actual convention sure. because they need Agreed. people. And I'll bet you that's exactly what's going to happen. So in, listen, I'm, you seem to be denying that it's possible even though you're saying it's possible. It's absolutely possible. No. You don't, you don't, but he doesn't have to bribe the delegates. He just has to bring his own. I'm not saying you're wrong and that it's possible. What I'm saying is there's literally no evidence he's doing it, is what I'm telling you. And why was it hard? And if he wanted to, why didn't he start last year? All the things, you're, of course, literally, in theory, could Hillary Clinton show up and decide to be our nomination, a nominee? Yes, she could show up and decide she wants to be our nominee. But why would I think that? Like, has she been talking about it? Has she gone back in the past and said it? No, everything but, uh, but RFK has, has said. But RFK Jr. has talked about it. He has flirted with it. He has made those kinds he of moves. He has flirted so with it. It's absolutely so, true. So, so big difference. He's flirted with it, but he's never said he's doing it. He's flirted with it many times. And then here's the answer. Here, here, when he picked his VP, why didn't he try to get, I don't know, Thomas Massey? Why didn't he get Rand Paul? I mean, if he would have gotten any someone like that at all, because, I would even go as far as saying Mike broke. Rowe. Because he's broke. Because he you needs just money. You told me he's got bazillions of dollars no, to give to the LP. I, I didn't say Don't give it to the LP. Give it to I your VP. I never said he had bazillions of dollars. I said that, he, that it had been rumored that he had made political donations to the LP. I didn't say he had a lot of money. I think that he picked his so vice presidential I. pick. I think he picked his vice presidential pick purely for financial reasons, not for because she's some you know, principle, she's more Hillary Clinton than, than Hillary Clinton is when you look at her policies. So yeah, if he really wanted the LP nomination, I'll give you that he probably should have picked yes. somebody who somebody who had a little bit more libertarian bona fides, but money talks and bullshit walks. And at the end of the day, people don't care about principles, Larry, as much as they care about cash, cold, hard cash. That's why you lost to Bill Weld is because the Libertarian Party thought that they were going to get Mitt Romney money through Bill Weld. That isn't what happened. <laughs> and yeah. you know, you know, uh, uh, it's true. Listen, we were both there on that day staring at staring Absolutely. political reality in the face. I haven't I've never learned as many political lessons in my life as I learned from the massive failures that I committed that day, including not picking you to be my, you know, to try and be my VP and team up and endorsing the horrible woman who stabbed me in the back immediately. Right. But lessons learned. Lessons learned. Now I, I'm by the way, I did uh, I did want to do that to sort of record. I did ask you. I did reach out for yes, that team up. But, yes, but you should have but you should have shown up for breakfast that morning when we were supposed to have our meeting and you didn't. So I didn't trust you because you didn't show up to our meeting. So now a little bit of history there. <laughs> Uh, let the record be shown. So anyways, back to the, the main thing at hand. For, this is what it looks like for, externally, right? I'm a Republican now, but I've got a lot of knowledge about third-party politics. 
What it looks like is sure. that you are a consultant for Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s PAC. You're Mr. Libertarian. Mm -hmm. So yep. when it comes to the LP, so what it looks yep. like from an outsider view is that they're asking people like you to help give them the kind of leg up that they might need should they try to run as a libertarian. Can you see why I would see it that way? Um, no. And okay. let me explain why. Okay. Uh, no, but it's a very, it's a good question and a good point. If they actually cared, why wouldn't the campaign have multiple libertarians on it? It doesn't. The PAC wanted me because they, they, they were tasked or decided to, I should say, the PAC decided to help out uh, Bobby Kennedy by getting ballot access. Who knows more about getting their ass kicked in ballot access than I do, right? I've gained ballot access in New York State and lost it in New York State. I've been in court eight times in New York State with ballot access. Nobody knows ballot access better than I do. So the PAC brought me on for ballot access, and I am happy to do so, right? Now, the point is, why would they bring on a guy like me to get ballot access outside of the Libertarian Party if they wanted ballot access in the Libertarian Party. Should they have asked me then, or, or, or should they have hired me or Nick Sarwark or Ron Nielsen or whomever you want to the, go get the, the nomination? Mike Heiss, anybody, right? These are all people who know how to get a nomination inside the Libertarian Party. Why wouldn't they hire those guys? And so, why wouldn't and why wouldn't the actual campaign hire them? So, then so why, that is my counter argument. So then why did the RFK Junior PAC hire you? I just told you for ballot access. I've already worked just on four ballot access. Them. Yeah, and to talk about ballot access, yes. Larry, I don't know. I mean, it just seems Okay, hold on. Have just... you have you not seen me speaking about ballot access and contingent election? I love you, Larry. Gazillion I, I, times Larry, I love you. In I've these learned last a lot couple of from months. you. I've learned a lot from you. This is not a slight. I would hire you to help me get the nomination of the Libertarian Party to help me get Libertarian votes. I would not hire oh, you for you. ballot access. I would not hire you for something like that because I would not hire you because that is not something I would think would be in your wheelhouse. But you're saying it is? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. I'll believe you. I'll Literally, believe you if, you, if you head over to AV24, which is the American Values PAC website, you will see that we already have collected enough signatures for four states. The states that we've collected the signatures for Three of them out of the four, which I pushed for, was to ensure, in my personal view, which is what I'm consulting for, to ensure that he's able to at least get the appropriate swing states to perhaps throw this into a contingent election. That is my view. Prior to me getting on, no one was even talking about contingent election. I've been talking about contingent election since Gary Johnson. Now, Gary Johnson didn't want to hear it. Joe Jorgensen didn't want to hear it. RFK Jr.'s PAC wants to hear it. I'm, and he, if RFK Jr. mentioned it, no one has talked about the 12th Amendment for literally how many years? The last time it was used was 1824, I think, if that right. I think it's uh, I think it's John Quincy Adams and Thomas Jefferson were elected to be the 12th Amendment. Those two were, right? That's the last time we've used it. But the libertarians should have used it in 2016, should have tried for it in 2020. No one talks about it. I have spoken about ballot access across this country more times than every single libertarian candidate ever in the past 50 years combined. Not even close, not even close. I do three or four hits every week talking about contingent election, ballot access, contingent. I was literally on Finnish TV, I'm not joking, MTV in Finland, talking about ballot access, contingent election. Okay, so you, yes. you've convinced me, you've convinced me. I didn't know that, so that's why you're here to, you're here to, to win me over. Um, now, you're still a member of the Libertarian Party. You do some consulting for 100%. the RFK, RFK Jr. PAC about ballot access. Okay, good, great. Let's let's move off of that for just a moment here and talk about the party itself. Um, Dave Smith and the Mises Caucus takes over the Libertarian Party. How you guys doing? How's the party doing in general ever since that whole takeover thing, uh, Ark? How's the, how's the, the cash? How's the uh, membership? How's the party's uh, potential vote total and presidential candidate looking? How's the LP looking since the takeover? Um, not great, to be very forward to you. Not great. The party is still divided, still fighting itself, which sucks. I can't stand it. It's still doing it, which I'm unhappy about. Um, I don't know how the convention is going to go. I don't know what's going to happen. We have six presidential candidates who are kind of at the top of the list. Most of them, except for Lars Mapstead, just want to do the same old thing. Um, Lars Mapstead actually wants to do a contingent election. He actually wants to, to focus on, on electoral votes, which I think is a great idea. I think that's the, exactly the right answer for us because we are going to struggle, right? We got Cornell West running, Jill Stein running, RFK Jr. running, and us. 
there is a chance the Libertarian Party might come in fourth or fifth this year. That's not a good look for us at all. So all those things could happen. We have to change our ideas, change our way of, of, of running this thing. We've got to go for gold on the map. We've got to go for electoral votes. And my view is, and this is my personal view, I think we have to go in line with the other parties. I think we've got to have like RFK Jr. win a couple of states. We got to have, you know, the libertarians win, say, that one electoral vote in Maine or Nebraska, something like that. Maybe the Greens focus on like Vermont or something. That's not happening, but that's what I think should be happening. We do that, happening. we get a contingent election. Uh, I agree, but you're happening. asking what should happen. This is what should happen. This would make the Libertarian Party part of a coalition of, of actual power. Sometimes right? I and feel- then- Sometimes I feel like Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean when he shows when he's like right his boat is sinking and he just he steps off the boat right at, onto the dock right when it goes down underneath the water line. <laughs> uh, and, and I got Look, out. Of if I wasn't an optimist, my friend, I would have quit a long time ago. Well, so I'm clearly an optimist. You, well, I'm I'm an optimist, but I'm I'm a cockeyed optimist these days. Uh, so so I'm looking at the future, but I got a little bit of a lazy eye. Uh, yeah, I'm looking around, yeah. just you know, watching my back here a little bit these days. I've learned my lessons. So the LP, you know, had its highest vote total under Gary Johnson. The Mises Caucus yes. and Dave Dave Smith take over the party, promising to increase it. Everything's going to be amazing. What? Why? Why? I mean, just infighting is is how it ripped apart. How can they infight amongst people who agree on pretty much everything? I mean, who are they no, fighting? I gotta, who are they I, fighting with? What? What? What went yeah. wrong, Larry? I I think and look, I'm Dave Smith's friend. I don't want to. I want to. I want to be as forward as I can. He's endorsed this. I Michael, think. Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. I I think him not running was a big deal. I mean, that was the deal for most people. Not he's, most. I'm, I'm exaggerating. For a endorsed, huge chunk of the people endorsed, who jumped on board. But he's endorsed Michael Rechtenwald. So what? That's but not I mean, Dave Smith. That's not. Be, it's as good a as lot Dave, of people who jumped on. Come on now. Now now you're just teasing. There is no way Rechtenwald is as good as Dave Smith. Dave Smith is very special, has many different things going on, many connections, a lot of charisma, way different than Rechtenwald. So I'm not, no disrespect on Rechtenwald. I'm just saying and being real. I'm not Dave Smith. You're not Dave. They're different people. People wanted Dave Smith. That's what they wanted. They didn't get Dave Smith. They're not happy. It's not the way, things aren't going the way they should have gone. So I think that's one of the biggest issues. I think that was a big issue. If he had actually run, if he had actually tried to unite the party, if he actually tried to do all the things, I think we've been in a different spot now. Not blaming him. He's got a family. He's got kids. He's got stuff going on. No shade to him. I'm just saying I think that's what happened. If I think if he, if that would, if he would have actually done what he said, I think things would be different. That is my, that's my, my gut feeling on that. But yeah, it's, it's not great. It's not great. I'm being forward with you. I wish it was better. It's not great. My hope is this year we can fix it. I hope this year if we make some impact that people will start realizing how powerful we are. And to be forward with you, people are talking about ballot. This is going to help the party in the long run. No one was talking about ballot access before. Now they are. Now the Republicans are trying to get rid of the, um, uh, the, uh, the make, make it a winner take all state for Nebraska. That wasn't a thing before. They're saying they're doing it because, well, we don't want Joe Biden to get that vote. You don't want Joe Biden to get the vote in 2020, 2016 either? No, no, no. You're doing it because you know contingent election is possible. It's possible with Robert Kennedy Jr. running, with the Libertarians running, with the Greens running. It's absolutely possible. It could happen this year. It could have never happened years before. There's a chance now. If the, if the Kennedy campaign does the right thing and spends its money in the right states, there is an actual chance of a contingent election that there wasn't before. I like you, Larry. Uh, I bear no ill will towards my former party. I wish you guys the best. I, I like you. And I think that, you know, you guys, uh, you know, you have good ideas, but the the strategy is just, it, it seems to be broken and irreparable. You would make a great Republican, Larry, and you would be an awesome Republican candidate if you were to run in the state of New York on the Republican line. I remember us having a conversation and me telling you when we were in Kansas City, get that Republican ballot line. And I think you refused, didn't you, at the time? Like, was that, that wasn't that a mistake, Larry? No, I'll tell you what the mistake was. And this is a personal thing. You are correct. You have, you have bugged me to be a Republican for a long time, I know. Yes. And you're not the only one. There were others. The Republican Party in New York State would recruit me in five seconds, right? right. In five seconds. The problem is, uh, uh, the problem is, a Republican has not won a statewide election in New York State, nothing. Governor, Senator, AG, nothing in 22 years. 
So and the state is just so becoming redder. I mean, blue so, or not redder. But so but that's number least, one. Right. But at least you're fighting a, a, a fight that while it may, you know, at least you're building something that it may have an apparatus that will actually grow. Like the Republic, if you're going to fight that fight, fight it in the Republican Party there, Larry. I mean, in New York State, at least the Manhattan Republican Club is active down there. You could like hang out with the muckety mucks. You could hang out with Donald Trump and, you know, Donald Trump Jr. when they're there at the Republican Club in Manhattan, Larry. You'd make a great Republican. They, they are the I, I can't speak for Republicans outside of my state. I will speak for them in my state because I know them in my state. The system is set up to grift, not to win. How do I know that? Because when I went to them, this is true story, 2021, you can check the, the, the numbers. I was polling at 6% in my state to run for governor when I hadn't even announced that I was running. 6% libertarian New York state is insane. So I went to them and I said, look, why don't you let me run in your primary? Because in New York State, we have fusion voting. So like Bernie Sanders is officially not a Democrat, but they let him run a Democratic primary. If the Democrats were actually honest and would let him win the primary, then he can run as a Democrat, but they're not, so he can't. But they allow him to. I said, let me run your primary. I will win your primary. When I win your primary, in New York State, we have fusion voting. I could run as a Republican and a Libertarian and a conservative, the whole thing. Every one of those I could run. And they went, you know, you're right, Larry. That might actually work. I said, that's a winnable race. We could win this race and and change New York. They went, wow, you're right. So what we're going to do, we're going to spend six figures and sue you off the ballot. That was their response. So mm. I'm not friends with the New York State Republican Party. They don't like to me. Be. They want to you, get rid of me. I'll introduce you around. Let me know, Larry. The, the Republicans <laughs> are my friends these days. I'm an officially credentialed delegate for Donald Trump here in the state of Missouri. So uh, if you need some connections, let me know. Larry, uh, we're coming towards the end of our conversation here, even though it's it's a lot of fun and, and we've been old, uh, friends for a long time. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners or uh, clue us, on, key us in on an RFK? Anything that we missed that you want to share? Yeah, I really do think that this is an important election and it's important. And his, believe it or not, his candidacy is important. Whether you like RFK Jr. or not, and here's why it's important. He has an actual chance of getting on the debate stage. He's got a shot. And third parties don't do that. If he gets in the debate stage, he actually might force uh, Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden to have a debate. Because as you know, debates are all about, without question, they are all about ad revenue. If he's able to be popular enough and the big CNNs and MSNBCs want him, they can actually get him on the debate stage. One of them will show up. Trump or Biden, whichever one thinks they're in trouble, will show up, which will force the other to show up. We could actually have debates if Bobby Kennedy's on the debate stage. Not just that, Bobby Kennedy should be on the ballot. You might go, Larry, why do you care? You're, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, independent. He should be on the ballot. Number one, because everyone should be on the ballot who wants to be on the ballot. I'm a big fan of ballot access in general, but my God, if he's on the ballot, it opens it up for every other independent party to be a real party locally and also nationally. I cannot tell you how important ballot access is. It is the way that we now have two private companies that run our election system right now. Private companies, Democratic Party, Republican Party. Larry Unacceptable Sharp. to me. Larry Sharp, thank you very much for your interview today. We appreciate your work. Can people find out more about your work? You can check me out, of course, at Larry Sharp. You can check out the pack at av24.org. There we go, Larry Sharp. Thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate you. Have a good one. Here in the state's grip. Here in the state's grip. I know they started to sink. I know Their they started hands to sink. In my life. Their hands in my life. The fringe of things hold. Germs are my dead sea. The just of things my creed. Unlock that bonus content. Thank you. Taxation. A cruel invasion. We'll get back. Camelia Peterson talking about suffocation. 
dictatorship in the USA. Enjoy the bonus content that she just unlocked. We'll be back. Up America Show's bonus content program, we end this series of the guns that won with the Ma Deuce, how the M2 Browning became America's machine gun. The M2 Browning, a .50 caliber machine gun, has been a constant presence in American military conflicts since World War II, showcasing its versatility across various terrains and battles. Affectionately known as Ma Deuce by troops, its deployment has ranged from WW2 aircraft to modern-day Humvees in conflict zones worldwide proving its effectiveness and reliability. It fires the .50 cal cartridge, a formidable and versatile piece of ammunition. Originating in the 1930s, the M2 Browning remains a primary weapon for the US military today, outlasting other systems due to its exceptional design and capabilities. John Moses Browning, a legendary firearms inventor, created the M2 Browning among other iconic weapons, driven by a lifelong passion for gunsmithing that began in his youth. Browning's collaboration with Winchester and Colt led to significant innovations in firearms, impacting military warfare and the development of machine guns like the M2. The M2 Browning was born from a request by General John J. Pershing during WWI for a heavy machine gun capable of multi-purpose use, leading to the development of the aforementioned powerful .50 caliber ammunition. Tested on the final day of WI, the M2 entered service in 1919, with Colt making key improvements to Browning's design posthumously, culminating in the official M2 model in 1933. The M2 has been a pivotal weapon in major conflicts, from WW2 to the global war on terror, demonstrating unparalleled utility in ground and aerial engagements. At Pearl Harbor, Messman 2nd Class Doris Miller notably used an M2 to defend the USS West Virginia, earning him the Navy Cross for his bravery. Not only effective on ground, but M2 Browning machine guns also played a critical role in air combat during the attack on Pearl Harbor, contributing to significant American resistance. In Vietnam, Marine sniper Carlos Hathcock famously used an adapted M2 for one of the longest recorded sniper kills, highlighting the gun's adaptability. The machine gun's power was also evident in the Battle of Mogadishu, where it was crucial for U.S. forces navigating intense urban combat, demonstrating its enduring relevance. From WW2 to recent conflicts, the M2 Browning has proven indispensable, offering unmatched firepower and versatility, a testament to John Moses Browning's design genius. Exploring the life and legacy of John Moses Browning reveals not just the history of a weapon, but the evolution of modern warfare and the enduring impact of innovation on the battlefield. Wake Up America show. I'm Austin Peterson. I'm glad and thankful to have you here. Thanks for sticking around and hope you enjoyed that bonus content. The final in the series, you unlocked every single one. The guns that won. W-O-N, not O-N-E. Uh, the bonus content program has been a tremendous success and I'm grateful to all of you for getting in those rumble rants, supporting the Wake Up America show because without you, of course, we wouldn't be able to produce all this awesome content like our new AI songs. Custom music for the Wake Up America show is so badass. 
Every day I add like to add something new, something fresh, something fun, and then sometimes there are some things though for a little nostalgia's sake, you gotta keep bringing them back. Like Camelia Peterson joins, joining us every Tuesday and Thursday, live on the show. Good morning, CJ, how you doing? Good morning, I'm doing good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gl glad to have you here, CJ. We appreciate you very much. Um, just to kind of like segue out of that discussion I was having with Larry Sharp, I kind of want to get your take on this because, you know, Larry was trying to convince me that, oh, oh RFK Jr. is not going to run on the LP ticket. But it kind of makes sense because I, I was just saying essentially that the, the LP sort of needs RFK Jr. more than he needs them to some extent, right? Right. I mean, if you look at any, at least through the online rhetoric, uh, the LP seems to be actively falling apart. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure the takeover, uh, the Mises Caucus takeover is having the effect that they said it would have. Uh, but, you know, it's so I, I agree, like they need him more than he needs them. Although I was thinking about this and I, and I just don't know, is the um, ballot access still a problem for him if he continues independent? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's always going to be a problem for him. I mean, they say that, uh, and this was in 2016, and now we have inflation. So they said in 2016 that the uh, total cost of uh, getting on the ballot in all 50 states, again, eight years ago, was a billion dollars. So it's probably a billion three, at least at this point, if you, if you want to get on all 50 states. But he really just needs to get on in the states where it matters, which is only six states, honestly. Okay, interesting. Well, I was just thinking there has to, we have to be running up to that deadline, right? I mean, that's got to be very soon um, across the board. So uh, I don't, you know, I mean, if he doesn't think that he has a shot of getting enough ballot access, then I'm not sure what the point is of continuing independent, you know, so it would make sense for him to move libertarian. But I don't know if he with his uh, VP pick, that's probably makes it a little more difficult. Yeah. Did uh, I did not catch whether or not Larry said anything about his VP pick? Well, he he did not. Um, I kind of floated the idea that she was, uh, you know, just there for the money because she's basically got all the same Hill positions as Hillary. She's to the left of Hillary Clinton, essentially, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, but Jennifer Halbein, she's she's a friend of the show. She says that uh, on the Rumble chat, the LP is not falling apart. Don't listen to Twitter trolls. The Mises caucus takeover is going well. Sounds a little Baghdad bobbish, Jennifer, and and I like you and 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 I appreciate your your support of the show. But yeah, I don't think I'm buying it, uh, Camelia. Well, and I would say, um, you know, not just from the Twitter rhetoric and the going back and forth, but I think that, you know, in objective measurements, you know, from a financial perspective, I think that's where some of the really serious issues are in how they are doing financially, because maybe it's changed, but the last I saw, you know, their, their staff had been reduced drastically and the fundraising had gone down drastically. And so I, they were, there were a lot of financial issues last I saw. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's the last thing I saw come out. And th those are things that anybody um, can see. Interesting. Well, you know, it'll be, uh, I'll be curious to see if what happens, because one of the things uh, Larry Sharp said is that the it's possible that the LP might actually get third or fourth this year in terms of, I might get like fourth in the, the presidential, meaning that it would be Donald Trump, Joe Biden, then RFK Jr., then the Libertarian Party in like fourth or even po possibly even fifth place. What if they placed behind the Green Party? At that point, it's just kind of like, yikes. I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. Yeah, that's uh, it. This is nothing if not an interesting election cycle, although it should be <laughs> it, it should be incredibly dull because we have so many limited options. I don't know. You know, maybe it helps. Maybe it helps the LP that our, our two main options are so bad. I would yeah. certainly think it should help the LP. And here is the thing. If it talking does about not... Donald Trump is amazing. God bless Donald Trump. Okay. I can't well... wait to vote for him. <laughs> I'm going to fall across broken glass if I have to to do it. But go ahead. Well, I just say, well, and you you will do that because you do not have a better option. And that's the reality of this. Well, yeah, is I'm that... not running this year. So, but if there but were. Right? <laughs> exactly. What's the, I mean, you know, wh why not? <laughs> <laughs> that's what my but first campaign slogan was when I announced, actually. Why not? Hashtag, hashtag why not. Yeah, no kidding. But that's go ahead, hilarious. Camilla. 
Go ahead, no, go ahead. I'm just saying, like, if there was ever a year that the LP could claim, like, we are the better option, you know, this is it. <laughs> no, it's not, because I actually think Donald Trump was not a bad president. I actually think that he did some libertarian things and did things that mo many Republican presidents would not have done. Uh, had they been the nominees, uh, Republicans that I would have thought had done a better job. I actually think Donald Trump is the best candidate that is running for president at the moment, whether it's, you know, whoever the LP might field out of that current field, other than maybe Josh Smith, but that's looking like that's not going to happen. And then there's RFK Jr. Definitely no. Uh, Biden, absolutely not. I, I, I just totally disagree with you, Camelia. You have Trump derangement syndrome. And I will cast it out and smite the demons from inside of you, Camelia. You've got to look at the positives well, that come with a, a Trump presidency. And in, in with the caveat of all of the possible options, I, I don't disagree with you in that sense, because I've not seen any LP candidates short of maybe Josh Smith. And I just think that he's, you know, he doesn't have it all together in every area to be a presidential candidate. And I and I like Josh, like, I'm sorry, don't take that the wrong way. But there are, are certain things you need across the board um, for especially for an office that big. And it's been, and with that much gravity, but like any I don't even know, like I've seen the names, I've, I've listened to some of them speak over the last few months. There's nobody that impresses me in in the LP candidate selection, and so yeah, I mean, if it comes down to to between RFK and you know Biden and Junior, I mean Biden and and uh, and Trump, then obviously you know Trump is going to be my choice because I do think there You're were a lot for, of good things. You're voting for him. Yeah, I mean, okay. there's I I won't deny that. I mean, I like given my options, I will vote for Trump because I think that that's. Um, there were good things that he did. Um, I'm very skeptical, and that won't change about how much he'll get done. And I just, I, I've said it a hundred times. You know, it depends on who he has skeptical around too. him. He's just one man. But you know, even if sure. let's say, okay, if you do have a little Trump uh, derangement syndrome, Camilla, just a little bit, right, a touch. If you do, then you should be happy to vote for Trump this time because everything in the freaking world is opposed to him. There, if if we're going to talk in a minute about Americans wanting a dictatorship, they're not going to get it under Donald Trump, because whether it's the 86 Democrats who run NPR in Washington, D.C., whether it's the Department of Justice, whether it's the FBI, the NSA spying on him and his campaign and the lies of Christopher Wray and the FBI and the Steele dossier and the entire Democratic establishment, the 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 Supreme Court's. The, uh, you know, the all of the courts of the country, they're all, they all voted against him with the stolen election stuff from 2020. The people that he nominated to be judges all overturned every election challenge they had in 2020. And the whole world is against Donald Trump. There is no danger of Donald Trump ever being a dictator, not in this United States. If FDR couldn't do it, it's Donald Trump's not going to be able to pull it off. Am I right or am I right? Well, <laughs> Sure. I mean, I, I think that he, I think his tendency, I do think he has some authoritarian tendencies, but I think that we those all, have been, don't we all, maybe, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'll commit to that, but <laughs> uh, we all want our way, I'm sure. But you know how we, mine decide is, that we're mine get is it mandatory paternity tests, but go ahead. <laughs> well, okay. What, another day for that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> But I mean, you know, that's I think that that opposition that he has gotten is what will push him to not be authoritarian. But if you think for a minute that Trump would not use those government agencies to his own ends, I think that you know, that might be misplaced trust. You're you're wrong, Camelia. He couldn't. He wanted to last time, and he couldn't. They all turned against That's him. That's what I'm he, saying. His own general, his own generals turned against him. So I mean, right. just he could have the most. He could be the most. He could be completely 100 percent all freaking Mussolini. And it wouldn't matter because no, they don't. The deep state doesn't do what the president says. The deep state does what the deep state wants or what the Democratic establishment tells them to do. So, I mean, again, nothing to fear from a Donald Trump presidency. Other, it, anything that he has has gotten across. What did he get across legislatively last time? But a bunch of libertarian stuff that you and I actually approved of, and that conservatives, by the way, really hated. As a matter of fact, that every libertarian thing that Donald Trump got across, Republicans have been. Right not happy with. I mean, DeSantis right. campaigned against the libertarian accomplishments of Donald Trump.
Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, and, you know, I will forever be grateful to Trump for Justice Gorsuch. And um, and I am very grateful that he had, you know, people around him who were speaking words of wisdom into his ear, like, you know, Judge Knapp and, um, you know, people of the Federalist Society and those kind of organizations. So I think, you know, that's it's so important who we have around him, which is one yeah. of the things that concerns me. But we'll see. Hey, well, Somniferum 75 over in the chat says he hired Scott Pressler at the very least around someone around him learned something. A, eh? A. Eh? Yes. Yeah, I do agree that that was a very good move. Did he hire him? Who made that decision? Well, I can imagine that had to have gotten signed off. It had to at least get, you know, because when you're choosing who's going to be the RNC, like he's going to have some say in on that, right? Right. Sure, probably so. Okay, all right. Let's move to the next topic. Talking about dictatorship, our friend J.D. Tuchili over at Reason uh, wrote a really nice piece. Americans don't want a dictatorship, but they're creating one anyway. About half of the public thinks it would be a bad idea if the next president is able to act on important policy issues without the approval or con of Congress of the court or the courts, uh, only 21% think it would be a good thing. And about 30% think it's neither good nor bad. So in the poll, 48% overall oppose unilateral presidential rule, including 58% of Democrats, only 45% of Republicans, um, the 21% favoring the idea include 17% of Democrats and 26% of Republicans. So support for unrestrained executive power, of course, rises to 39% among Democrats in the case of a Biden win and 57% of Republicans if Trump wins. So <laughs> there are a lot of people who would love to see a dictator, aren't there, Camelia? And, you know, I know in the article, um, J.D. talks about how that, you know, looking on the bright side, at least there's only mm -hmm. like, what, 20 percent of people that, you know, are are definitely in favor of a dictatorship. <laughs> to be this, but if, the, if that other number that concerns me the most, that 30 percent of apathetic people who are like, because eh, like that's how we've gotten to where we are now. It's because so many people are kind of like, ah, you know, who you know. <laughs> <laughs> he also has a subheading in here. He says, the system isn't working if my side isn't winning. So about half of the public, regardless of party identification, says the system of checks and balances dividing power among the president, Congress, and the courts is not working well these days. Only one in 10 say it is working extremely or very well. So this reflects the frustration with institutions that are in the hands of political opponents. The system isn't working if my side isn't winning. But that's true. If Democrats are running things, the system probably isn't working very well. If communists and progressives and socialists and authoritarian leftists, you know, cut your wing wing off, you know, lefties are running things, the system probably isn't working very well. Agreed, right? So I think that, well, and this is why but we talk about sometimes- if our side was running things- Right, right. So, you know, we talk sometimes about gridlock in government being a good thing. Um, because, but we also want, you know, we also want the majority in, in the legislature and in the president so, see, so that we can actually get things done, but there are probably some downsides to that as well. Everything is trade-offs, right? Uh, but I was thinking about this and, and this idea where we've gotten so polarized, um, culturally and politically to where they can't, nobody wants to find common ground and work together anymore. And this this comes up a lot, you know, in in my line of work with what I do because we are willing to do that. Like, it, you know, I don't care on any issue if, if if we're working with Democrats to get towards our common goal, whether it's education reform or or anything else. Like, that's totally fine. We should be willing to work with people. And this is something that I get hit on a lot. And not just I don't usually, you know, put my Americans for Prosperity hat on here, but I'll talk about that just a little bit because. One of the things that I get criticized a lot from some on the really hard right who tend to go down all the conspiracy rabbit holes is they'll say they'll use this like six degrees of Kevin Bacon and say, oh, you know, your your org, you know, supports these um, these 
organizations that have woke policies and whatever, you know. And the reason that they say those things is because we will work with some of with different organizations and different people on things where we're working towards a common goal. We're not trying to dictate, and we call this pluralism. And pluralism has come, I think, on the right to be viewed as a dirty word. And I think that's really unfortunate because it stops us from getting good things done. And it also stops us from, you know, finding sometimes we have to find that middle ground. Like if you want that, like the abortion issue in Ohio, where people were like, you know, we don't like this really extreme abortion option, but it's better than the opposite ex extreme. So like nobody got a middle option and you got the worst option as a result. I have a conspiracy theory. Uh, and my conspiracy theory is that in the state of Missouri, where Republicans are working to try and enact pa a bill that would pass school choice, that the public school backers are spreading lies about how this bill will force gun control onto homeschoolers. Because I'm seeing a lot of homeschoolers and a lot of like crunchy granola conservatives here in Missouri freaking out about the school yeah. choice bill saying that this is going to go into their homes and the cops are going to kick down their doors and shoot their little girls in the face and take their guns and bathe in their blood if we pass school choice here in Missouri. And I think my and this is my conspiracy theory, I think that some of that's probably being funded, organized and the conspiracy to stop us from having school choice in Missouri is happening right now. Uh, what do you think about my conspiracy theory? I think that it's certainly possible from everything that I've seen and the ties that certain people that are in the opposition will have. Do I think that's all of it? No, I, I think a lot of it is that people are uh, gullible and uh, outrage works, fear works. This is like COVID. You know, you saw what fear did to people in COVID. Well, now we see this, except for it's on the right. If you want to get somebody opposed to something, you just tickle their worst fear and taking your guns away. That's one of, you know, the, the biggest fears on the right. So you're going to find a way and you'll get all these people to say things. And in this particular uh, issue that's come up, it does at that point, then it doesn't matter who you bring out that says, that's not what this does. Nobody's taking your guns away. There's no risk of that. Like it can be the Missouri Firearms Coalition. It can be, you know, other experts or people who are who know what they're talking about and they won't believe any of them. And then they'll go like try to hire an out of state attorney to come in and give his legal opinion, which is actually incorrect because he doesn't know Missouri statute that well. But I mean, it is you, they get hung up on all of these little things and i do think um that is certainly what you're saying possible. is that people who are easily frightened are easily manipulated definitely right and the, and the thing is is once you're in that mode like if you are in where you are operating from fear it is very very difficult to think rationally and to to think outside of that fear and it like you don't see it that way <laughs> but right. we're not use. I think we as libertarians, uh, limited government types, we're not using fear enough. Um, we are not. <laughs> we're not. We're not. We're not. We I uh, as you heard in my, my discussion about the, the caucus last week, when it came to the gambling proposal, I appealed to people's patriotism, sense of liberty and, and love of country. And that was ineffective. But when it came to the selling uranium to foreign countries, I just played on their fear that we wouldn't be able to immediately send aid to Israel for whatever reason that they needed to. And by stoking their fear response, I was able to manipulate them into supporting free trade and, and capitalism. So lesson learned there, right? We're not, we really do need to be, we really do need to be not just winning hearts and minds, but we also need to be um, bashing heads and cutting throats. And I think this is part of the the challenge, especially in in the information age and in the digital age, is those all of these things like they're going to take away your guns that spread like wildfire because of the internet. And then pretty soon you have a lot of conversation around it because 
you know, some guy out of, I don't know what state with some prepper homestead sites doing a YouTube, a video about something happening in Missouri. And like, that's getting, he has a large following. And so all of a sudden everybody has their hair on fire. That's not in Missouri because they're taking away their guns and they can do it to our state next. <laughs> and so that makes it more challenging because the difference is, is like, you can fear monger people into believing things in no time flat. They just got to read a blog post, watch a video, whatever it is. Yes. But if you Good get idea. those same, if you get those same people into a room one-on-one -on -one with us, and this is actually what we were doing last night. We were doing a meeting in a room where we talked about this issue and the facts and the myths about it and the state of what things actually are. And they see that, you know what? We're real people. We're not monsters, you know, that want to take away your guns. And that once you get people one on one, like it's completely different. Yes. But you're right. Like part of our challenge is that we have to utilize the other tools. Um, do I want to stoop to their levels of saying things that are really flat out lies yes. um, in order to get my way? Yes. No. Because no. the truth, the truth, <laughs> the truth should be withheld from the people who are too stupid to understand it and accept oh. it because, because they because their stupidity has been weaponized against me. If Adolf Hitler builds an army of Wehrmacht and those soldiers are conscripts, meaning essentially slaves, and they're too stupid to say no to coming to war with me then uh, yes, I will propagandize against them and I will kill them if they try to kill me. If, if democracy is weaponized against me, I think weaponizing it against the bad guys is just self-defense. Camelia, is there anything else you would like to see or hear or listen or say before we let you go? <laughs> well, I would just say kind of going back to the dictatorship thing, you know, I was thinking that, and, and what we just talked about too, is this goes really all the way back even to the founding of the country the majority of the people in America at the time were not necessarily wanting to go to war for their independence. Oh, and so a third of them did not. Hundreds of thousands of them fled to Canada where they thought there would be freedom because they were a part of the loyalist cause. What an idiot. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's why Canada is in such bad shape is because they got overrun by those loyalists. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's why it said that liberty is not for the masses of men because it's uncomfortable and it's, it requires risk taking and personal responsibility. And so it's hard. Yes. And the, the democracy is a tool. Uh, and it's a weapon, a dangerous servant and a fearful master. That's a fake George Washington quote, but I'm going to talk, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about George Washington, a little rant before we get Daniela in here. Camelia, thanks Good. for everything. We appreciate you. We'll see you next week. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great day. Uh, lies. Should you lie? Should you lie? Well, if you're in a war, do you lie to fight the enemy? I'm thinking about George Washington. I'm thinking about Speaking of loyalist fleet fleeing to Canada, what was George Washington's first job in the military? Guess what? He was a spy. Yes, he was. Remember that whole rumor, I cannot tell a lie? Well, that is a lie. Uh, I don't think George Washington ever said that because he definitely knows he had to lie. George Washington had to lie a lot to found a country. He knew he had to lie in order to fight the British, in order to fight the bad guys. Do you, can, would you, if the, if Kerman Hans, you know, if Colonel Hans showed up uh, and you're hiding Jews under the floorboards, you're hiding Jews under the floorboards, are you? Uh, is it wrong to lie to a Nazi? Do you lie, is it okay to lie? To, of course it's okay to lie to a Nazi. Of course it's absolutely okay to lie to a Nazi. I think the problem is, is that libertarians that don't recognize or understand spycraft. I wish, and this is me going back, harping, talking about how, you know, because I, I can't tell you how many times I've been on like a secret mission or I've been doing what I can't, like a fight for liberty. And I've been doing it in a sense, sort of undercover in a way, right? Where I'm not like out there bow, you know, like fighting and you know, all like the, the battlemen saying everything that I believe and all this kind of stuff. And like, charge a bayonet charging up the hill yeah lads right there have been times where i'm taking a more subtle approach where i'm sneaking up on colonel hans where i'm you know I've, i'm clicking my bayonet on right but i'm fighting for liberty and i cannot tell you how many times retarded libertarians have have blown up my spot and been like hey what do you mean look you're over there like shut up shut the up dude you do not understand what i am trying to accomplish right now this is why you will never make it in the revolutionary patriots army you will not be able to win the fight for liberty we need spies we need spies we need spies we need 
to wake up America. Daniela Pensack, coming up next. Thirsty Thursday. America Show's bonus content program, we end this series of the guns that won with the Ma Deuce, how the M2 Browning became America's machine gun. The M2 Browning, a .50 caliber machine gun, has been a constant presence in American military conflicts since World War II, showcasing its versatility across various terrains and battles. Affectionately known as Ma Deuce by troops, its deployment has ranged from WW2 aircraft to modern-day Humvees in conflict zones worldwide proving its effectiveness and reliability. It fires the .50 cal cartridge, a formidable and versatile piece of ammunition. Originating in the 1930s, the M2 Browning remains a primary weapon for the US military today, outlasting other systems due to its exceptional design and capabilities. John Moses Browning, a legendary firearms inventor, created the M2 Browning among other iconic weapons, driven by a lifelong passion for gunsmithing that began in his youth. Browning's collaboration with Winchester and Colt led to significant innovations in firearms, impacting military warfare and the development of machine guns like the M2. The M2 Browning was born from a request by General John J. Pershing during WWI for a heavy machine gun capable of multi-purpose use, leading to the development of the aforementioned powerful .50 caliber ammunition. Tested on the final day of WI, the M2 entered service in 1919, with Colt making key improvements to Browning's design posthumously, culminating in the official M2 model in 1933. The M2 has been a pivotal weapon in major conflicts, from WW2 to the global war on terror, demonstrating unparalleled utility in ground and aerial engagements. At Pearl Harbor, Messman 2nd Class Doris Miller notably used an M2 to defend the USS West Virginia, earning him the Navy Cross for his bravery. Not only effective on ground, but M2 Browning machine guns also played a critical role in air combat during the attack on Pearl Harbor, contributing to significant American resistance. In Vietnam, Marine sniper Carlos Hathcock famously used an adapted M2 for one of the longest recorded sniper kills, highlighting the gun's adaptability. The machine gun's power was also evident in the Battle of Mogadishu, where it was crucial for U.S. forces navigating intense urban combat, demonstrating its enduring relevance. From WW2 to recent conflicts, the M2 Browning has proven indispensable, offering unmatched firepower and versatility, a testament to John Moses Browning's design genius. Exploring the life and legacy of John Moses Browning reveals not just the history of a weapon, but the evolution of modern warfare and the enduring impact of innovation on the battlefield. And freedom. Here in the state's grid, I'm Austin Peterson. I know they started to sing. You're watching the Wake Up America show, and we're glad to have you here. It's a synth wave style. What's old is new again, and what's new is me and you. Every Monday through Friday, the Wake Up America show streams live. 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. Two hours of pure economic freedom and personal liberty. Does the shine out of 
pay your taxes yet? Monday's deadline approaches. What is taxation anyway, really? It's a solemn mission. Taxation. Cool invasion. Hope you're enjoying the new music this morning as part of our new <laughs> our new AI takeover. Well, we have seen our next guest in a couple of weeks. We're glad to have her here. She is not a robot, even though she basically looks like one of those replicants from Blade Runner. <laughs> Daniela Pensack joining us live right now. Good morning, Daniela. How are you? Good morning, Austin. Uh, I don't think it's that great. You're right. It is tax season. I got my taxes done yesterday and uh, not happy about it. But, you know, it's what we do to stay alive, unfortunately. Yeah, no, for sure. It's what we it's the price we pay to live in civilized society, right, Daniela? I suppose it is, yeah. <laughs> uh Daniela, we're glad to have you here. Speaking of civilized society, um, apparently not uh not everybody is pleased with the socialist system that we have cooked up. When you actually apply redistributionist policies directly rather than indirectly through the income tax that we're all paying on Monday, um People actually get really upset about it. So strippers, for example, uh, they might vote Democrat if they if you were to poll them all. But when you actually implement redistributionist policies, the strippers get mighty upset. What's this story? So two strippers in Alabama are getting into some legal conflict with Sammy's Strip Club, their previous employer, because uh, they were enforcing that the strippers would redistribute their earnings with the rest of their um, less successful cohorts or co-workers in the workplace. And uh, it turns out they're not too happy about that. Um, it's it's a form of, you could say, DEI practices in a stripper situation where um, the less attractive ones don't make enough. So they get a portion of the others more attractive strippers earnings. And um, what this suit found out is that this is actually becoming more of a common situation in some workplaces in the United States. So um, workplaces can bypass some labor laws and it could be more cost effective for the employers. But it is uh, it's not fair to to some of the other workers that just earn more wait a minute so dancers are suing this strip club saying that the system that is placed put into place to help the less unfortunate the ones who are less endowed to get a leg or a tit up uh and and, and now they're upset about it like they think that it should be based on merit is that what i'm to understand Yes, you know, it does seem that they want to be based on merit, especially when you're working in a situation um, like a strip club. You know, they're they're sharing more than tips here. They're sharing everything that they make with everyone else. And um, it's a little bit unfortunate and it's not fair because, you know, I was never a stripper myself. I don't intend to be for a while. way look a certain way and uh share that with others that just simply aren't like you had mentioned endowed in the same way um but here we are everyone needs to be equal everyone needs to be on the same playing field as everyone else i guess even in this situation i just want everybody to know and understand and, and full disclosure here I, that i did not pick this story by the way that daniela daniela you came to me with you pitched this story to me right I did find it a little salacious, but I think that fit the, uh, especially for Thirsty Thursday, Austin, I think this would be a more of an appropriate story. <laughs> I agree, Danielle. Dan Danielle, what was your master's degree in? Public policy. Okay, well, we're putting it to good work, <laughs> fighting against socialism at the strip club, and we're glad to have Daniela Petsack back. She's been gone for a couple weeks. Uh, Steffi, my lovely Liberty wife, says merit-based stripping sounds legit. She says some strippers are better than others. Very, very true. Not that you would know, Steffi. You've never been to a strip club. Uh, the Wake Up America show is live. Click that like button and the follow as well if you'd like to come back here and join us on Thursdays. We call it Thirsty Thursdays because we've got the lovely Camelia and Daniela joining us as regular guests. So if you like our guests lineup, you want to make sure to click that follow button so you can come back and join us regularly, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. Uh, I love this other story that you found me. It is a year old, but it's new again because the Joker 2 movie featuring uh, Lady Gaga as uh, the love interest of Joaquin Phoenix's Joker character 
has got people stirred up because the headline was just so damn good. Let me just read it from the formerly former blog Jezebel, apparently out of business. Now they say um, Joker two fandom will marry men's rights activists and the internet's loudest girls. Why were, why did you find this story so compelling? I saw it floating around online yesterday a little bit. So, um, and as a fan of the previous Joker film, I enjoyed it a lot, actually. Uh, I didn't know that they were going to cast uh, Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn until yesterday, and those stories floating around. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about, uh, especially considering what you had mentioned, what the headline said, what the article uh, mentioned. But uh, it does seem that a lot of incel joker fans are going to get laid this year uh in october because a lot of lady gaga fans apparently more liberal women or more outspoken women i'm not i'm not even entirely sure what the article is exactly exactly saying but what it, what i do understand is that they're introducing a new uh fan base or a new demographic into experiencing and watching this this uh the sequel and uh because the previous film from what the article had stated of the Joker film, the original 2019 film, has a certain fan base. As they said, men's right activists or incels or a certain type of demographic, an online demographic that we are all uh, aware of. Um, and because of Lady Gaga being introduced to the film, there's it's leaving some people concerned about what the new uh, fan base is going to be like, who's been introduced in the film. Others, I think it's a moment of joy because like I had mentioned, um, I think the story of the Joker, especially in the original film, is an important story, uh, is an important message to share to people. Um, and I, like I had said, some insults are going to get laid. Yeah, That's a good thing. <laughs> I want to I want to talk about that point. But why do you think this is an important story? Well, because I think a lot of fans. Now, I'm not a big like Harley Quinn fan myself. Um, you but don't have, you don't have I, Harley Quinn energy. You don't you don't exude energy. chaos. Yeah, you don't you don't exude chaos to me, right? So right. so so I, I it would it might be hard for you to sort of identify with her, but you can sort of see those qualities in other women, right? Yes, you certainly can, especially these days, especially with the rise of uh oh, what's it called? Borderline personality disorder uh <laughs> diagnoses. Uh, which is debatable whether or not that's a real disorder or not from what I've heard. But uh, yeah, with like with in, with the incline of certain diagnoses of women these days, with the incline of SSRI, uh, with the SSRI pandemic that everyone's getting prescribed. Um, I think there's an overclinicalization of women personally going on, but that's just my opinion. Um, but yes, there, I would say that there is a certain type of woman. I mean, what's uh, what, what it's called like the pixie manic dream girl archetype. Or something like girl, that. Like, yes. is that popular for mm -hmm. guys? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Where she, where she's, his, <laughs> where she's, she's the main character's muse, and she leads mm -hmm. him. You know, she leads him either into destruction or into love, or in this case, both. Uh, but, right. but I, it, it's fascinating because I, I, you know, I've never been an incel, but I, I do frequent the manosphere spaces, and I do agree with many of the sort of the red pill or the the men's rights activists uh, views when it comes to things like, you know, the treatment of men in family courts, the drugging of boys and how we essentially have a gynocracy in academia with young boys, you know, being forced to sit still. And our system is not is is essentially treats everyone like little girls and sort of hammers us all into com compliance. And I think that, you know, the Joker what what the Joker represents is really sort of an exp not just male rage, right, or the explosion of, of of toxic masculinity into the streets. Because you know, if there's a toxic masculinity, there is a toxic femininity as well, and certainly we see that with you know whether they be school shooters or you know with men who uh, you know commit horrible crimes or of of rape or assault or theft. But there, uh, I think that it's important to to sort of get an understanding of you know what is contributing to this this urge to sort of to go against society to reject mainstream society there's something healthy in that even if it's displayed in a toxic manner i don't even know and and, and probably the same when it comes to harley quinn right that there's a toxicity you know she represents like that sort of when you say manic pixie dream girl what we're really, you know, talking about here are women with either 
self-diagnosed disorders or real disorders projecting their insecurities and their mental illnesses onto society. So, but there's there's something healthy about you know getting that out there and and examining it. I I, I guess I have to say, Daniela, I don't know how you can express the problems that we view that are creating these issues that make people want to turn into these characters or identify with them so much. What, how do we express those problems in a healthy way? How do we take like those toxic ideas that are contributing to the creation of Harley Quinn or the lionization of Harley Quinn or the, the, the toxic sort of incel vibes that you will in men, how do you express those in healthy ways? Because the very few times that I do see people expressing those same kinds of ideas in healthy ways, they still kind of get hammered down by society in a way. And the only way to express them is sort of either violently in real life or depictions mm -hmm. of violence in film and TV. Is, is this making sense, what I'm saying? It does make sense. And I think that's... Uh... Now, I think a lot of people watching this could also understand this as like of, of a libertarian mindset is that we are inherently like anti-systematic um, and, you know, we want to go against the grain. I certainly, especially during tax season, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, very uh, you feel very Harley Quinn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Right. Like the inner Joker, inner Harley Quinn came out yesterday yes. um, when I went <laughs> to H&R Block. <laughs> but um but yeah no i get what you're saying and this is a thing especially for the right wing as what i'm seeing there's a lot of these like uh you can, this is also like occurring with the trad um like subculture kind of you want to go against the grain against what society has been teaching you and this seems to be a rising thing especially among generation z where a lot of people are going like uh, are anti-systematic in their perception of the government and society and culture in general is that some people or a large portions of people are going to be thrown in the wayside anyway through violent acts or just through being recycled through the system there's unfortunately i'm a little bit of pessimistic in this view but i think it's um, inevitable and it's going to happen anyway um how what individually we can do is i think we i mean and to be safe i don't want to like say anything but we do have to work with the system um you can't like be anti uh you can't work against the system always because that does lead to acts that would be deemed as a little you know violent um or a, a little illegal and i'm not going to promote those views here uh, or at all, I, but I, um... will, I will Google. <laughs> okay. <ag> Google, <laughs> right. agor Google ag agorism, counterculturalism, the black market, if you will. Um, I'm speaking to Daniela Pensack. <laughs> she joins us live here on the show. We're glad to have you here. If you haven't clicked that like button, please do so. We appreciate Daniela for getting up so early because she's on the West Coast. That means that she gets up way earlier than the rest of us to be able to join us on the show. So show some gratitude and show some respect to our very own Harley Quinn this morning. She's got a, Maybe she's got a little bit insider when the taxes come down. Um, people in the chat are upset that we keep bringing it up, but that is the reality. There is something, I think, of these characters inside us all, a desire to rebel against the system, a desire to blow it all up, not violently perhaps, but in a metaphorical sense. It speaks to my sort of revolutionary libertarian impulses. This is, and, and it is because of my revolutionary impulses, my desire to overthrow the system to an extent that I think is what really, what truly separates me from conservatism, right? In that I am, uh, when people talk about, you know, uh, being a conservative, or, or, you know, or, or classify me as such, it always bristles because when I think conservatives want to keep things the same, they want to maintain these, these, these traditions, but there's a revolutionary spirit that, that exists that is anti-conservative in a way. It, it's anti-progressive, right? Because we're revolutionary. The revolution is against a progressive system, right? But I, I guess, you know, bringing it back to the whole incel thing is that like the men's rights right and the, or the manosphere or the red pill i mean we're kind of having a moment in in uh at least in internet society maybe not in the rest of culture but i mean this does sort of represent and it, and this is what this jezebel article is talking about because they're so upset about it they don't like that there is some kind of a representation of like the the inner pain that some men feel from the simple fact of the matter is i mean daniela you're an at least an eight OK, so you don't see, you know, you'll never you'll never date a three. OK, you're never going to date a four or a five. Like whatever your husband's going to be is going to be at your level or above, because as you've said on the show before, women are going to date across or they're going to date up. OK, so women in society 
they if they only date across and up, and if most women have very high standards, men who are one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven are just not seen by women in society. I mean, we're it's like being invisible, right? You just you know you you can open doors for them, you can like you know serve them coffee and all these kinds of things, but it's like they're basically invisible. But this Joker movie is making them visible, and a lot of people don't like what they see, at least especially specifically with this article. But we're seeing it now, not just in mainstream culture, but I mean, it's what, what we're seeing in mainstream culture here with this movie is only the tip of the iceberg for what exists on the internet, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I would I would hasten to say that I don't think, like, would you say, Austin, that attractive men would date like an eight or a nine would date a three girl or a two girl, though? I mean, this seems to be just a, gen a general principle for both sexes, I would say. No, you no, know, it's not. It's different. Men and women want different things and are different. And 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 a man will date a man who's a seven or an eight will will date a three or a four or five. I guess. And... Yeah. Well, men typically, yeah, they're less uh, or they're more compromising, I would say, actually, when it comes to maybe looks than women are. That's true. Um, I, I feel like women are more uh, more driven towards product, though, uh, like a, what man can provide. So that makes sense, I guess, in that realm. In terms of looks, I don't know. I feel like men are a little bit picky with looks. But from my experience, they also typically are more compromising. Like they, they just want to get laid to more than women are. Um, so I guess that's a debatable issue. But yeah, I for what you see, uh, women these days, um, especially now since they're more educated, they make just as much money as men or they have the capacity to at least. Um, women do want to like date at their level or above. What I've also said, though, is that women are going to have to compromise. Like it's not a sustainable system if if women do want to make as gonna, much money as are men. You gonna, are you going to compromise, oh, ma master's absolutely. degree? Absolutely. Like so you, I will. I will. Five. Well, in terms of attractiveness, listen, if I if I if we have chemistry, I don't care how he looks. And I, I have listen, I have dated guys that I wouldn't say are conventionally attractive. But if we have chemistry, that's all that matters to me personally. Education level, like I'm going to practice what I preach. If he doesn't have a master's, but there's there's something there, I want to compromise that. Right. Um so but that's that's what has to happen it's not a sustainable system socially speaking for women to earn as much be as more educated but then they're not willing to compromise if a man has just like a bachelor's or no, no degree at all yeah. um women, take, women yeah. voted we, we voted to take the jobs and the money exactly. from the men so. and to and to give it to the women <laughs> yeah. And then the women got the money, and then they complain that they're that they can't find a man who makes more than them. Is that about correct? Yeah, that and that is, and that's not fair for men. And uh, I'm more than willing to say that, and I see that happen every day, and it's unfortunate. And um, women just they have to compromise, but and so I I'm I always will agree with that part. Danielle, it's I've just been, it's going to be been, uncomfortable for them. I, I've been asking all the ladies who have been on my show the last couple of weeks this question. Hmm. Beware, minefield, danger, danger. Okay. <laughs> All right. Would you would you rather have equality or chivalry? Mm, that's a good one. When you say equality, what do you mean by that? Meaning that you get the same jobs, you work the same amount of hours, you get the same amount of pay. Uh, you have to put up with the same kind of shit that men get, right? Your your mm. your feelings your feelings are not going to be uh considered in society right where facts aren't going to care about your feelings no one's going to hold the door open for you you're going to split the check 50 50 right you might even make more than your husband and be the breadwinner and you're going to have to be okay with it maybe he might even be a stay-at-home dad if he doesn't make as much money as you so so you know you're wearing the pants you get to set the rules right that's that's equality chivalry is you get the door held open for you you probably don't have to go to work you might get to be a little bit more of a stay-at-home mom. Uh, your feelings will be considered, um, uh, even if they don't align with the facts. And you know, you you have the option to be a housewife, and et cetera, et cetera. So, which which way are you going? Oh, I have the option to be a housewife in chivalry. Well, well yeah, with well, yes, yes. Like... I mean, unfortunately, inflation has made it so no one can really be a stay-at-home <laughs> mom unless you're very, very wealthy. So. Well, I find it to see it like either or. I mean, with equality, I see it more like if as long as I have I'm endowed like the same opportunities as men do. Um, but when you say chivalry, well, it sounds like, well, if I have the option to be a stay home mom or have a job, that seems um, to be the situation. But we you're, live not in now, be, you're not going to be CEO. 
you're not going to get the you're not going to be at the C level suite. You're not going to be, you know, you're you're you know, you could have a job, but you're going to be like a secretary. You're not gotcha. going to be you're not going to have a position of influence. You're not going to get run for office or anything like that. So which, I mean, which, 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 which I'm more I'm much more meritocratic. I get the question. I just want to I, before I answer, I just want to make I just want to be clear about my uh, my views. I believe in a merit meritocratic system, most of all. So men or women. Um, and that's the ideal system. Now, when people say quality and they conflate that with like meritocracy, um, that when I hear quality, I think of meritocracy. So that's a system I would more so uh, prefer. Um, it sounds like what you're saying. It's more black and white, though. It's like um, women were. It it sounds like more you're talking about a gyno a gynocracy in the first half than a quality, well, no, in my not opinion. So, not really, not really. So so not so much. More it's it's really just more about like. You know, you're gonna pull. You want to play. You're gonna play by men's rules, right? If you want equality, right? right? You're, you're. There's not gonna be a special treatment that for you. There's not gonna be mm -hmm. any diversity, equity, or equality. There will be like you know meritocracy to a degree, gotcha. right? Right. But you're gonna have to compete with men, right? And yeah. you're gonna. It's not gonna be. It's not gonna be. Uh, you know, a leg up or you know, people aren't gonna pay attention. You know, there's not gonna be any trading on your looks or anything like that, right? So it's gonna be. It's gonna be on a level playing field entirely. And you don't get special benefits. You don't get special treatments. You might even pay for the first date, mm -hmm. <laughs> for example, right? No doors yeah. held open for you. No, you know, no acknowledgement of your femininity or feminine role whatsoever. You're you're essentially on a level playing field. So, you know, in underneath that scenario, you know, you're you're you walk with men, you talk with men, you're treated like a man entirely, right? There's mm -hmm. no special treatment at all. Which way gotcha. are you going? the first one equality you're going for equality okay so when the titanic is going down you're not getting mm -hmm. on that lifeboat you're staying right there with me and the rest of the men that's right going, austin i'm helping you keep the ship, the ship up right. <laughs> or keep me on the ship yeah okay. well that well, the, the way that you just described that that's kind of how i view the world now though so I, men aren't even like men don't even have chivalry really, anymore like let's well, be real well, you, not in Washington State. You've never, you've never <laughs> dated a woman, so I'll give you. I mean, not that I know, but you, or that you shared. But I'll just say that I'll just say that what we actually have is we have special privileges when you want them, and equality when you of want course. that. What we really yeah. have is a situation where you want to have your cake and eat it too. Have you ever heard the statement, the the saying, "There are no feminists in house fires"? Yes. Do you know yes. what that means? Same concept yeah. as like no, the I get it, right? I get it. Well, to a certain degree, like women, and I, I don't know what like progressive feminists say anymore. They're kind of mm -hmm. crazy now. But like women, I mean, they they clearly we have less physical prowess than men do. I it cle and clearly that's going to just translate differently in society, regardless of opportunities that are given. Right. Um. I I mean, I I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe, obviously, that women should have the same opportunities as men do. But in a meritocratic system, clearly what's happening right now with the DEI system um, and everything else of that sort is is anti-meritocratic and I'm wholeheartedly against that. When it comes to things like what you just described with the house fire situation or like the Titanic, I mean, that has more to do, I think, with physical capacity um, than, than like more cerebral output, I would say. Or emotional right. output, right. but just, women are just, also I've, more emotionally weak as well in most cases. So yes, I just I've never you know I've just I've never been on a date with a liberated woman and had her ever reach for the check at the end of the meal. Daniela, <laughs> Daniela, we got to run. Uh, it's great to see you again. Uh, we hope to see you again more. We love having you on on Thursdays at eight uh, eight thirty a.m. Central Time. Is there anything else you want to hit up or plug before we go? I'm always going to plug my Twitter, Austin, like you'd mentioned earlier uh, before we got on. It's a little bit esoteric, so be careful. Tread lightly if you're going to follow me. But it's at Pedsec Um I'd love, to, I'd love to see you on there. I'll follow you back. And um, that's what I'm going to plug. I can't wait for next week, though. I'm excited. This was a good conversation, Daniela. Good stuff. Thanks for pitching those <laughs> topics. They were very spicy and good. Your topics, by the way, you chose. <laughs> Have a good one. We'll see you next week. See you next week. There you go. What do you guys think of Daniela Pensack? I see that the chat has been inflamed. Let me offer you some hemorrhoid cream in this trying time. <laughs> Wake Up America show streams live every Monday through Friday, but not this Friday, not tomorrow. No, we're out. I'm taking my wife to see Thomas Jefferson's house, Monticello, and then I'm going to take her to 
the Marine Corps Museum at Quantico. It's a two and a half hour drive from DC to, Mon to Monticello. Then it's a two and a half hour drive from Monticello to Quantico. Then it's a two and a half hour drive back to Washington, DC. Tomorrow is gonna be a very busy day. Then on Saturday morning, we get up, we see the Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington, DC. Oh, the Cherry Blossom. I will eat much sushi and drink much sake. And we will have a good old grand time. I will not be here, but the show will be on. We'll just be doing a replay. So definitely come back here tomorrow, watch the show, enjoy. I just won't be here live. I might check in on you in the morning, though, but I'm probably gonna be driving or I'll be at Thomas Jefferson's house. Love you guys. Thanks so much for joining the show. Don't forget to visit ap4libertyshop.com. Exit through the grift shop. Have a wonderful day. I hope you guys enjoyed the new artificial intelligence created music for the show. We'll see you guys uh, live on Monday on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Bless me with something. Oh, gosh. of time, a year might seem like a mere moment, but oh, what a year it's been. In September 2022, Austin and Stephanie Peterson embarked on a journey, a journey to wake up America. They began humbly, with just 20 souls tuning in, learning, listening, and though challenges arose, like the looming shadow of YouTube demonetization, their spirit never waned. And now, thanks to you, thousands rise with the sun to join them, to listen, to engage, to be a part of a community. So here's to you and to wake up America for memories shared for friends made for the journey ahead and for never ever forgetting to rise and freedom happy anniversary I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message believe me Austin Peterson is the best he's got the greatest wake up America show I've ever seen whenever I tune in in the mornings and watch the live stream let me tell you he has got the absolute best content. I love his guests. It's just a total blast to watch. And I highly endorse and recommend the Wake Up America show. It's terrific. Believe me. Is the outdoor your home about as exciting as a library? Then spice it up and unbore your space with our custom metal signs. Crafted with love and a bit of libertarian magic, you can customize your own metal sign at ap4libertyshop.com. So head to ap4libertyshop.com, customize your own metal sign today. to a world of vocal discovery at Peterson Voice Studio. I'm Justin Peterson, here to guide your musical journey. Envision a place where your voice reaches new heights, where every note tells a story. We embrace all singers, from the enthusiastic shower vocalists to aspiring stars, ensuring each voice finds its unique rhythm and tone. Are you ready to elevate your voice? Visit petersonvoicestudio.com and sign up for remote lessons tailored just for you. Let's begin this melodious journey together.
Tired of spending your hard-earned money on woke corporations that don't share your pro-freedom values? Fed up with sipping liberal lattes and progressive cappuccinos? Introducing Founding Flavors from AP for Liberty Shop. Get your day started with Washington's revolutionary roast. As robust and principled as the man himself, this blend is the shot of energy heard round the world. Or maybe you want to taste the fervor of freedom with Adams's patriotic perk. It's as dynamic and balanced as the U.S. Constitution, sure to awaken your spirit of liberty. For the aficionados, we've got the Jeffersonian Java, a complex mix of flavors that speaks volumes about your refined tastes. And don't forget Betsy's Liberty Lullaby, our decaf option. Crafted with the same care and dedication Betsy Ross put into our star-spangled banner, this blend lets you enjoy the taste of freedom anytime without losing sleep. No woke beans here, folks. Just pure, patriotic patriotic, pro-freedom flavors brewed with love for liberty. So why compromise your principles for a cup of coffee? Stand up for your values, perk up your patriotism, and start your day the American way. Get your founding flavors at apforlibertyshop.com. 